with the um, <coughs> tension between the sort of horizontal cross-border nature of the internet and the vertical system of national jurisdiction is growing. I want to make a clarification first of all. The internet is technically and technically borderless. It is not based on a geographic architecture. However, this doesn't mean that there are no borders and jurisdictional borders on the internet. When you move from a website in .com to a website in .cn, you are crossing jurisdictional borders even if you don't understand it. Just like when you are in the Schengen space in Europe, you may be crossing from France to Belgium without any control. Nonetheless, you are under different jurisdictions. The key problem is that, therefore, we should talk about the internet and the internet spaces as cross-border rather than borderless. The problem is that the geography of these jurisdictions do not map one-on-one -on -one the physical jurisdiction of the different countries. Without getting into details, there are extension of the jurisdictional power of sovereignty outside of the physical territory. And vice versa, there are situations where uh, the citizens of one country are actually under the quasi-jurisdiction of another because of the types of internet applications they use, because of the types of domain names that they have bought. To give you one concrete example that you're probably familiar with, when the um, website uh, Rora Directa was seized by the um, Homeland Security arm, uh, the ICE arm of Homeland Security, because it was bought by a Spanish operator through an American-based registrar, this was a de facto extension, perfectly legal in the current architecture, of the uh, national sovereignty over the territory of another country. And there are many other examples of spillover effects, like for instance, when the filtering that is applied to some ISPs in um, India filter down to Oman because of the peering arrangements between the operator in Oman and the uh, telco operator in India. I don't get into detail. What I wanted to highlight is that we are witnessing a situation where the exercise of national sovereignty has potential transboundary impact uh, on another territory. And the problem is that for a lot of platforms and services that use the internet and that target users around the world, there is a tension between, for instance, their terms of service and the national laws of all the countries that they operate in. And so without getting into details, what I want to highlight is the danger or the situation that we're witnessing today is not the type of situation we had in the past whereby sovereignty was working by separation. Basically, sovereignty is still about delimitation of clear frontiers where the sovereignty of one country is on one side and the sovereignty of another is on another side. What is at stake with the internet is the management of sovereignty and jurisdiction over shared spaces and an overlayering of jurisdictional competence rules that take into account, here again not getting into too much detail, criteria that are the location of the user the country of incorporation of the platform of operator, the uh, location of its servers, and even the type of domain name that this operator is using or where it bought the domain name in question. And so to bring this larger picture of overlapping jurisdictional problems to the question of cloud computing or cloud services, if you take into account the location of servers to apply jurisdictional criteria, you have a new type of tension because the benefit of the cloud is that precisely the data is distributed on several servers that ideally are distributed around the world to provide the better quality of service. If you need to have an application of all the different jurisdictional criteria 
based on where those servers are, you destroy the very purpose of cloud. As an, as an illustration of this problem, you may not know that Jimmy Wales, the founder of Wikipedia, explicitly, explicitly says that he doesn't put any server for Wikipedia in England because of the libel laws in Great Britain that wouldn't be uh, uh, compatible with the way Wikipedia works. So Wikipedia, as a matter of fact, is a typical example of the kind of problems that cloud computing may, more than other actors, experience with the uh, patchwork of jurisdictional uh, criteria. Thank you, um, Bertrand. Um, now we have um, going to have a discussion on the panel about uh, recurring pro problems that have arisen in many comparable online contexts when it's related uh, to the cloud. For instance, we have some legal obligations um, that have um, that some governments um, some governments are discussing some new legal obligations to build in intercept capacity into internet services, whether it's Canada, UK, um, the United States, some efforts from the United States in previous years, um, some other challenges regarding um, voluntary sharing of data when, for instance, even though they pol the police will need a warrant to access communications, Sometimes there are no immunity. There are immunity. There are no liability in the statute if they sharing the data voluntarily, um, and if they need to share it, um, we should be the limits. You know? So there are a lot of challenges right now, uh, taking into account that lately we are using the cloud in our daily lives. We are relying more and more on cloud services. Um, all the data that in the past was in our house, in our offices, are now moving to the computers. Um, it's not any longer in the hand of each of us in our hand house, but in the hand of third party providers. So we are going to invite Ian Brown. Um, Ian Brown, uh, where are you? Are? <laughs> uh, uh, he is a senior research fellow at the Oxford Internet Institute. He's a well-known academic. He has also written recently a report for the Global Network Initiative on cloud computing. Thank you for coming, uh, Ian. Thanks, Katitza. Uh, and I'll, I'll say a bit about the UK in this first part of the discussion because I think the UK really is a leading government on internet surveillance uh, in, in ways perhaps that the civil liberties community would not um, like. Let me just briefly, met, um, Bertrand, on the libel side, it's it, that, that libel question uh, that, that Jimmy Wales raised is very interesting because in a way this, the UK libel law is almost a, a, an illustration of, you know, almost pre-internet, uh, very sweeping claims of jurisdiction within the UK that in an internet era are very problematic and I, I, I don't like to disappoint Jimmy Wales, but the fact that his server is not in the UK would not stop the UK courts from finding a connection to, to English law. <laughs> um, although we are trying to reform our libel laws right now. Let me say a bit about um, lawful intercept in particular. Um, the UK, the current government, uh, actually the current government and the previous government have been um, developing for several years now uh, new lawful interception requirements on communication service providers. Like many other countries, including the US, um, we, we have had for a number of years requirements that telecommunication service providers uh, have a lawful intercept capability. That is to say, if a government agency comes to a, an ISP or a phone company with a lawful uh, warrant in the UK case, not actually a court order, unusually, a, a warrant signed by the Secretary of State, the a cabinet member, um, authorizing an interception, th then the internet service provider has to be able to uh, undertake that interception. Alongside that, again, like many other jurisdictions, we have uh, laws requiring internet service providers to keep um, basic communications records about what their users are doing online. When they, were, when they were connected to the internet, who they have been communicating with via email and in the, in the case of phone companies via 
mobile telephones, and there's also some specific um, information about location of the phones that, that must be recorded. That's a, an EU-wide requirement under the Data Retention Directive, although actually that, that directive was driven by the UK, and the UK had broader data retention laws before the European Data Retention Directive came into place. The UK uh, law enforcement and intelligence agencies are now complaining that, that the data that is retained about people's internet use is not broad enough. As people are moving from traditional email to use things like uh, social networks and uh, to communicate uh, instant messaging, even um, online virtual environments and online games, uh, those agencies are concerned that they will lose the capability to um, put under surveillance people that are using those mechanisms to, to plan and to commit um, criminal acts. And therefore, the, government, the current government has proposed a very sweeping bill in Parliament, uh, which is currently being uh, looked at by a special select committee of, of Parliament, um, that would really potentially broaden out those requirements for uh, intercept and this, particularly the storage of this communications data about what, what people are doing. Um, and it, it, it could even go as far as, um, under the, the text of the bill, uh, giving the government the ability to require not just internet service providers, but actually pretty much anyone providing any kind of communication service online. To some extent, it could be argued even down to an individual that was running something like a Tor node on, their, on a home PC uh, to, to record this communications data and also to facilitate the recording of communications data and intercept, right down to the level of specific algorithm, cryptographic algorithms, for example, that a, a system could use. Uh, and mobile phones, of course, encrypt voice. Tor is encrypting data packets as they flow through. So a, a very broad-ranging bill. Um, there's been a lot of criticism uh, from the civil liberties community, and it's not clear how, whether this bill will, will pass into law as is, whether there'll be substantial amendments in Parliament, or even whether the government, as has happened in the past with this time of legislation, type of legislation, might have to step back, withdraw the bill, and introduce something more uh, limited in future. Um, I'll just say a couple of, other, couple of other things about the UK regime that I think are, are interesting for this, this discussion. Uh, a, a big issue, as Katitsa mentioned, about privacy of people's uh, communications records, especially, but, but more broadly, data about people's activities, is that in many countries, including the UK, government agencies uh, can ask companies that hold that data to voluntarily provide it to the government agency. And in the UK, the Data Protection Act uh, specifically allows for, for um, purposes related to, to criminal investigations, actually a broader range of purposes than that, for data controllers to voluntarily provide uh, data to the government. And in trying to work out, as I did for, for a, an academic article earlier this year, which you can find online, it's called Government Access to Private Sector Data in the United Kingdom. I suspect, although I can't confirm, because there, there are not procedures by which these voluntary provisions of data have to be notified, say, to the Information Commissioner, the, the Data Protection Regulator for the UK, certainly not made public or notified to the people uh, whose data we're, is being handed over. There's no central point at which you can find information about that. So I suspect that there is a lot of this going on, uh, a lot of data flows from the private sector to UK government agencies um, that are not transparent and, and notified to individual users. So that I think that's one big problem. Um, a second problem that the UK surveillance regime in general is very untransparent, uh, that people are not notified um, if they have been the subject of investigation after the investigation has closed, which would be a good way of trying to prevent abuse. Um, the, the, the normal courts do not, by and large, have jurisdiction over how these powers are used. Uh, intercept evidence is not allowed to be used in court cases because the intelligence agencies worry that that would reveal their methods and their sources. So d data, in day-to-day -day hearings, courts are not looking at the, ev the evidence and whether it was lawfully obtained. There is a special tribunal uh, that exists to investigate alleged abuses of um, interception capabilities by the intelligence <coughs> agencies. Um, however, they hear very few cases because how would people ever know if, if data about them or their communications have been intercepted if they aren't notified or if there is not some other organized way of that notification happening. So in practice, that tribunal has only, I think, in, I think it's, it is heard a few hundred cases 
during its lifetime of about, I think, a decade, and it has only found in favor of the complainant, and I think six cases was the last time I looked at that. Uh, limited information about um, their decisions, of course, that they're not going to publish full details of what, what was alleged to be going on. Uh, and then finally, I think, in, again, interesting in the UK for the broader discussion, uh, the ability for one-stop shop access by government agencies to data about people's online activities. We, we certainly have the case uh, in the UK that uh, accredited police agencies are able on, a, on a, a particularized but automated basis to access communications data about people, so records of what people have been doing online. Today, that's, that's reasonably limited, that communications data, that's just the basic data about their uh, that w when they were online, their subscriber data, names and addresses of the customer that the ISP holds, who they were talking to by email. A big problem if you, if you massively broaden out the scope of this communications data, as the communications data bill would, then you're talking perhaps about a lot of other information about people's online activities and social networks in online games, a lot more geolocation information in total, which will paint a very detailed picture of an individual's life. It's, I think there's now a, a false dichotomy in, in many countries' laws between the contents of the communication, so what's in the email or the phone call, which in many countries, including the UK, is very strictly protected, versus this communications data, these records about what people are doing, which are becoming richer and richer and broader and are accessed under much less strict safeguards. And I think that's something that the cloud will make even worse uh, and that I think we have to think very carefully about and we'll come back to solutions later in the session. Thank you, Ian. Um, it's interesting the comments you make about the voluntary sharing. Um, I believe that um, not only that's um, a bigger problem for especially uh, small companies who might not have the capacity or the resources to be able to challenge um, those requests or those pre political pressure from the government. Um, okay, and so now we would like to learn a little more about the challenges um, that are being uh, happening in India. And for that, we have invited um, Elonite. El <laughs> Elonite. Hickok, Hickok, okay. Uh, policy associate for the Center for Internet and Society in India. Um, right, hello, my name is Ellen I. Hickok, and as Katita said, I work for the Center for Internet and Society based in Bangalore. Um, it's an NGO, so I'm representing the civil society perspective of these issues. Uh, I think what we have seen uh, from the Indian government and uh, their response to the cloud and some of the issues that have arisen is that traditional forms of lawful access are not applying to the cloud because of the distributed issue and the jurisdiction issue. Um, I think traditionally the Indian government looked towards MLATs to solve that problem, but the MLAT process is not working and many people in India are unhappy And so, um, with that process. And so um, I'm sure you guys have heard about uh, the, the RIM scandal. So the Indian government has been asking for blanket access and encryption keys from different server providers so they can um, monitor these communications and monitor the data that is happening and going to other countries. Um, so far, uh, what's been happening with RIM is that the, the government asked for RIM's encryption keys and Finally, RIM set up a knock in Mumbai, and now again, RIM has suggested that um, intelligence agencies in India have the or create the capability to intercept those those communications as well. Um, I think there are a lot of factors that play into this response from the Indian government, and a lot of factors uh, in India that also complicate this issue. So for one, India does not have a comprehensive privacy legislation. So that creates a lot of vulnerabilities for data stored in the cloud and, and stored in India in general. Um, I think also uh, service providers in India are decentivized from, um, from not providing and not 
complying with lawful access requests or access requests from the government because of heavy penalties that the government puts on non cooperation so for example service providers can be put in jail or in prison for seven years for non cooperation this is actually changed over the years the telegraph act first asked said that they would be penalized with six months in prison and now the ITA says seven years in prison and at the same time intelligence agencies are not held liable for illegal interception that happens so I think there's issues of liability and also there's no incentive for for service providers to really protect information and not hand it over to to intelligence agencies I think you also have issues cultural factors as well feeding into the government's fear and and why they want to access all this information and I think this might be very much a developing country issue that needs to be taken into consideration when we we look at principles so there's there's internal threats that are very real India has a huge population lots of lots of diversity in religions and ethnicities and these are all factors that the government is trying to balance and I think it gets augmented when suddenly the the information is stored on the cloud I think also you have seen some emerging trends from the Indian government so there is emerging legislation coming out that is asking for broader retention of data and longer retention of data and at the same time there is unclear authorization to who can access that data so you have authorization standards lowering broader retention standards happening and I think this is complicating civil liberties as Kikita pointed out I think there's also a problem with implementation in India though there are safeguards that do exist in the Indian regime these are not always followed and leaks happen and data is not handled as it's supposed to be handled and you have problems with chain of custody you saw from the near radio tapes that's that's one example of these issues so I think that's a short summary of some of the issues that developing countries have around this issue of lawful access and some of these issues are augmented or exacerbated by by the cloud I think thank you Elena we have that the inability for civil society to be able to challenge surveillance because the programs are shrouded in secrecy because individuals are never made aware they have been surveilled because of standing issues etc some companies like Twitter and Google have tried to shed light on those issues and we have invite invited to today Mark Crandall from the global compliance team and Google to shed light a little about the problems of what they are doing with the transparency report and whatever reaction he wants to make from the panel well I think I think at Google one of our primary concerns particularly within the United States is reforming our existing government access laws when it comes to online information for example in the United States we have something called the electronic communications privacy act which was passed in the 80s which involves the steps that governments have to take in order to obtain information about users online and we think those laws for example need to be updated so that the protections that exist for information that is in your home also exists for the same type of information that would otherwise be stored in the cloud in that respect we take a leading role in what's called the digital due process coalition which is a reform advocacy coalition involving this type of law which we just talked about essentially we'd like to see these type of laws modernized in a number of ways we'd like to see better protection of data that's stored online similar to what I just mentioned we feel that the government must first get a search warrant before obtaining any private communications or documents stored online government requires process in order to get this information typically but we think that the government should have the ability to get a search warrant before obtaining any private communications or documents stored online thank you thank you
but we'd like to see the same type of process required for online storage as what would otherwise be required for the government to go into your house. Um, we'd like to see better protection regarding uh, location. We want to see better protection regarding your location privacy. Um, we think the government should also get a search warrant before it can track the location of your cell phone or other mobile communications device. Uh, we think it should be updated in that regard as well. We all uh, use, uh, a lot of us I should say, use devices that have location capabilities and that should require equal protection. Um, we'd like better protection against monitoring of when and with whom you would communicate. Uh, the government has to demonstrate to a court, we feel, that the data it seeks is relevant and material to a criminal investigation before monitoring when and with whom you communicate uh, using email, instant messaging, text, the telephone, anything. And finally, we think that we need better protection against bulk data requests. Um, we talked about the growing, uh, uh, the growing corpus of information online. We feel that the government needs to demonstrate to a court that the information it seeks is needed for a criminal investigation before it can obtain data about an entire class of users. Um, this is what we'd like to see with regards to the United States and the reform of our own, uh, our own regulation. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Mark. Uh, I would like to see if there is any question uh, from uh, remote moderate, uh, from the online participation and the remote moderator, please. Is there any questions uh, online? Uh, no, no questions online yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like <coughs> to see, see if there's someone from the law enforcement community or someone who would like to make a, a comment um, on the panel so far a question. Um, please, um, the lady on the end. The microphones, please, uh, for the lady on the end. Thank you. Um, we are hearing all the time from the civil society uh, some ideas like uh, go and uh, rectify the law. Yeah. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's working. Okay. Why? We know that when legislators wants to make laws, they have to understand the subject of the law, the situation to be uh, regulated. So what are technical people, what are technology people, and civil society saying up to legislation? Okay, we are all the time nagging and saying, oh, the civil liberties are at risk. Uh, we are all the time uh, controlled, we are checked. Why don't we tell legislators how to do to get rules convenient to the new environment, which is the internet, to their needs to protect national security, and then to our needs to feel free and to feel not tracked all the time. I mean, we have to give them factual things, them how. So um, I would like to give the floor, yeah, just a second, uh, to Wendy Seltzer um, from the technical community or to give um, a brief intervention, maybe. <laughs> uh, one of the things that uh, technologists um, are often called upon to, to help with is to uh, explain the the possibilities and the impossibilities. Um, and so sometimes there are difficult questions asked to which it's not possible to give a clean technological answer that says, yes, if only you take these steps, you will have the solution to all of your law enforcement problems or on the other side, uh, all of your civil liberties problems. Uh, these are, are messy issues. What we can do is to help to elucidate the challenges and uh, some of the, the solutions that are better and worse uh, for, for solving those problems. So we can note, for example, that uh, 
because of the difference in jurisdiction and uh, the fluidity of data in the cloud, uh, if people don't have protection in one place uh, for the activities that they want to engage in, they may simply go someplace else where their data will not be subject to the same retention and tracking rules uh, and uh, circumvent the, the kinds of uh, protections that someone meant to put in place by imposing that surveillance uh, so that uh, a, a solid protective regime for, for people trying to store data online uh, can be helpful to everyone uh, who's trying to achieve uh, a better relationship there. Uh, it's good for companies because they can sell uh, a stronger uh, product to their consumers. It's better for law enforcement because uh, at least it, it keeps the activity in jurisdiction rather than sending it elsewhere uh, where they have uh, even less uh, con control over it. And it's better for those uh, seeking privacy uh, because it assures due process and transparency of, uh, of the rules relating to uh, information collection and uh, its use. Thank you, Stan, um, uh, Wendy. And now we have um, Bruce Schneier, which is Chief Security Technology Officer of VT from the private sector, also the United States. Hi, good morning. I actually want to make three quick points. Uh, one of which has been said uh, many times, that data is moving to the cloud. Uh, in, in general, the problem I think we're dealing with is that people are now losing control over their computing. And, and it's happening from two different dimensions. On the one hand, our data is moving to the cloud where uh, the regulations are not the same as the data was in our house. So perhaps it's held by a third party, perhaps it's held in a different country, perhaps it crosses borders. And there are a lot, and these jurisdictional issues are very difficult and, and things we're wrestling with. The other end of this is that we're losing control of our, of our end devices as well. I mean, I, I, I'm using an iPhone and I have much less control over what I can put on this device than I do my computer. I can't put an antivirus program. I can't even write a file erasure program. The, uh, the updates this device gets are largely opaque to me. And, and this is happening a lot, and whether it's uh, smartphones or tablets or ebook readers or gaming consoles or cameras, these devices are increasingly internet ready and are increasingly opaque to the user. And so in both cases, there is a lot of issues of, of control of tr uh, and really of trust, that we are trusting whoever makes either the end user devices or the in-cloud data stores to protect us by obeying the law, by not overly mining our data, by keeping the data within borders. It, a, and there are, there are technical solutions to these things, but it's not clear that the companies that build these devices re really want them. I mean, there's a lot of value to keeping data unencrypted in a cloud provider, a cloud provider wants to mine that data for advertising purposes and, and, and or, or for beneficial purposes for you. So I think that is the big trend here that we're trying to fight. I mean, the, we're now moving to a level of sophistication in computing where things are moving out of our control, but that has legal and jurisdictional implications. So that's the first big trend. The second is that you know, as we're learning, Governments are discovering the internet. We're using it for more and more of our, of our socialization, of our business, of our commerce. So more and more of our lives are moving onto the internet. So we're seeing more government scrutiny onto the internet. I mean, the question asked is why can't the technologists tell the lawmakers what to do? The problem is the technologists really don't, sorry, the lawmakers don't want to hear that. I mean, the lawmakers are, are seeing balances that they set 10, 20, 30 years ago being upset by this new technology. And what they want is to move the old regime, whatever it was, into this new technology. 
which often is impossible because it doesn't work the same. But that doesn't stop lawmakers from trying. And lawmakers are under pressure from two areas, under pressure from, from police forces who want access to data for various reasons, and they're under pressure from industries who want things to remain the same. In the United States we, oh, and elsewhere, we're seeing enormous fights by industries who make business on copyright trying to force the internet to be just like records and tapes and other, and other physical objects, and it's not working. So what we're seeing, I think, I mean, I, I see it in the U.S. And, and, and certainly elsewhere, is very heavy-handed internet regulation that doesn't really take into account the subtleties of the internet. And, and that's, I think that's causing more problems than it solves. I mean, last year in the United States, we had a debate over an internet kill switch. And that debate takes many forms. I like to think of it as a big red button on Obama's desk. I mean, however, but however you think about it, as a security engineer, that's an utter disaster. But as a police force who wants to say, shut down the phone system, it's the same thing that they had before. And convincing them it's difficult is hard. So those are what I think are the two meta trends that really affect this issue. And I'll stop there. Um, thank you, Mbruz. Um Now we have... Um Sophie Tawasi, uh, she, it's pronounced correctly, Tawasi? Tawasi, yeah. Uh, Sophie from the Council of Europe. Uh, thank you, Sophie, for coming to our meeting today. Thank you, Katitsa. Sophie Kwasni. Um, yes, so I work for the Council of Europe uh, in charge of data protection, but I work for a wider division, which is the cybercrime and data protection division. And I think that the fact that those two issues uh, uh, have been brought together recently in the Council of Europe is a good signal. Uh, we've heard that many of the issues uh, discussed today infringe upon civil liberties, uh, right to privacy in particular. So bringing them together, at least at the secretariat level, it, eno it, it enables us to really uh, work closer together on those issues. And so I'm very happy even if with a data protection background to come and, and mention some of the issues raised by the cloud. Um, so it was said there is a regulatory framework. It's been there, it's been there for years, it's been working. The problem with the cloud, and I th the title that you chose was cloudy jurisdiction, it can be foggy, murky, is the fact that the boundaries that we knew uh, are more and more blurred. Uh, they are blurred on a number of levels. The first one I would like to mention is that um, the law enforcement side, access by law enforcement, is shifting in some places to uh, surveillance, uh, uh, intelligence, and traditionally, uh, if some of the safeguards we have been putting in place in the Council of Europe uh, have been applicable uh, uh, to the law enforcement, it's true that for the intelligence side, it's, it's always a bit more difficult. So making a clear distinction between both is, is important, and, and in practice, it's more and more difficult. Um, another type of blurring is about the data. Uh, those regulatory frameworks, they, um, <coughs> they define the types of data that can be accessed. Uh, I will use the, the terminology of the Council of Europe, which is the Cybercrime Convention terminology. Uh, we, we, we see that uh, they can be accessed to traffic data, but when you're accessing uh, traffic data, are you solely accessing that or are you also accessing content data? So there again, the frontier between those types of data is less clear than it used to be in the past. Is data at rest? Is it stored on a computer and can be uh, accessed under search or on seizure? Or is it data in transmission, which then should be uh, covered by other types uh, of mechanisms? Uh, we heard about the voluntary uh, 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 transmission of data. Uh, there is uh, indeed under the Convention on Cybercrime direct access to publicly available data. Uh, this data can be accessible with no further authorization. And when there is uh, access control restrictions, 
a lawful and voluntary consent must be obtained from someone with the lawful authority to disclose the data. It's this voluntary mechanism of disclosure of data. The question being, who's consenting to, the, to that? Who's got this legal authority? Is it the cloud user himself? Is it the cloud provider? And finally, uh, blurring of the form of cooperation. It's from formal to informal, from this legality of a framework uh, to requests covered by infinite terms of service of the, of the cloud uh, providers. And the last point is the blurring of frontiers. That's obvious, and it was mentioned before, the jurisdiction questions, uh, which law applies, which safeguard applies, uh, and uh, the notion of consent is also understood differently around the planet, so how do we, we apply that? So those are basically, for me, the issues at the moment, and uh, if you allow, we'll tackle later the solutions that uh, can be proposed. Thank you. Thank you, um, Sophie. I would like to take uh, four or five questions from the floor, uh, if there is any. Uh, one. Uh, we should take notes. Hi, good afternoon. Am I audible? Yeah. Hi, good afternoon. I'm uh, Priya and I represent. Oh, Hi. Hi, good afternoon. And I'm Priya and I represent the Internet Service Providers Association of India. I, I happen to sit on their executive council. Uh, I have a question for the panelists uh, just to give you a brief background. The Indian regulator has uh, called for an approach paper on. Uh, regulatory concerns about data and cloud computing and other issues. So I'd like to uh, hear from our panelists today, are there any best practices or guiding principles that we as service providers should be uh, giving inputs in terms uh, to the regulator on how best we should uh, approach these concerns about cross-border uh, protect data protection issues and the jurisdictional issues? Is that something we could, you know, as an approach to the government, suggest because the government is inviting the service providers to come on the table and uh, discuss all these issues. Yeah, thank you. Um, another question, uh, just uh, to clarify a little, uh, we are going, the second part of the panel, it's about solutions driven, and your question will fit perfect on that. So I will uh, wait for the panelists to, in the second part before they answer okay. to you. It's we, read, we wrote your question. Is there, is there any other question? Uh, no. Pranesh? Um, just in order to, to be a little contentious, um, w w one of the things <laughs> we're, we're talking about here is changing of, uh, of defaults. Uh, in the sense that uh, if everyone is using SSL and PGP, then that significantly changes the default from the age of the telegraph okay, when interception was easier uh, so when only those people who wanted to encrypt could use code language in there in there so how do we address this issue now this is something that law enforcement agencies are actually quite concerned about okay it's not about whether people can code because they can always do that they have always done that but the issue of changing of defaults. That is a, is a problem that, uh, and, and, and so I would like to kind of reiterate what the lady from the back said. Okay, we are bringing up all kinds of issues with privacy, but I think we have to provide uh, good ideas about security as well, uh, not for individual security, but how law enforcement agencies should and could go about it, which doesn't rely solely on the idea that judges clear it because judges can be you know people who aren't well versed with the constitutions of the country judges can be people who you know executive magistrates who are policemen in India can can be counted as judges for for these kinds of purposes as well so it can't that can't be the single point solution um, just specifically on that Pranesh, well on the two points that you made I think first of all the rule of law is the best that we have, and if you have problems in individual jurisdictions with 
with the judiciary. That's something that needs to be addressed within the, the judiciary and the level at which authorizations can be given for very sensitive things like interception. The encryption question is really interesting because this has come up a lot in the, the UK discussion of this bill because, of course, you know, what the government would like to happen is that internet service providers essentially uh, intercept using deep packet inspection equipment all of the traffic flowing internationally to, to servers where the government does not affect does, does not effectively trust that that international provider will under under the right circumstances provide some of this communications data so that the ISP themselves within the UK jurisdiction can can provide it and what happens if the tr if the traffic flow is encrypted and this this comes back to the question from the, the lady at the back this caused this question caused enormous confusion to the government um, they they I, I, I know if you you know that you wouldn't expect MPs to read Bruce's, uh, Bruce's wonderful old book on you know 500 pages of cryptographic algorithms, but just the concept that ISPs you know they can intercept the traffic, but it won't mean anything, um, seemed to be very hard to get over to the government in the UK. But they they finally got it, and they and they came up with some extraordinary solutions. Like um, we'll keep we'll record everything for six months, and then if we're interested in the traffic, we'll go back to the provider and try to get their cryptographic keys, um, and then decrypt it, which again was remarkably. Um, <laughs> impractical so we'll I think we'll come back as Katita said in the second part to better solutions but the debate has been as confused in the UK as India I think thank you uh, is there another question please um, the lady um, first um, a white lady and then the lady in the back <laughs> The microphone. I know you want. I have a question, for Bruce Schneier. Um, I uh, I want now uh, how do you uh, differ cloud-centric security issue from traditional? And uh, what character uh, makes security issue uh, only cloud-centric? What character uh, characters make security issue cloud-centric? Right. So, I mean, so the main difference between security on your desktop and security in the cloud is you don't often have access to the the security, the controls especially as you move to cloud computing where you expect the cloud provider to do actual work for you. So if you're using something like Dropbox where you're just storing files in the cloud, like a very simple cloud service, then that's relatively easy for me to secure. I can encrypt my files, I can move them up there, so I don't care where, the, where Dropbox puts them in what country, how they move them about, because right? they're not doing anything with them. Contrast that when the other side, on the other end with something like Facebook where Facebook is only useful if that company has access to the actual data I post. Right? They're in charge of who sees it, they're in charge of how it's used, how it's displayed, and I have no ability to secure that data. I mean, I don't even know what operating system Facebook uses, let, let alone able to audit their systems or mandate certain controls. So as we saw two weeks ago when Facebook made a mistake and uh, users data was visible to other users they might not want I mean we don't even understand what that mistake was and so fundamentally as the as the data moves out of your control you have to trust the provider more I mean you know even on your computer you have to trust your providers you have to trust the operating system vendor the application vendors the hardware vendors but I still have some amount of control I control my antivirus I control my networking environment as data moves to the cloud, as my computation moves to the cloud, I have much less control. Right? Email I have on Google servers, I have less control over than email I have on my own servers. There's less I can do. So I'm trusting that Google will properly secure my mail, will only respond to lawful orders. You know, I have to trust that company. And that's the main difference. Right, I have less ability to, to, to have control and less visibility in what controls are in place, and I have to trust more. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, please, uh, Mark and then Bertrand. 
um, that, that raises a very interesting point regarding lack of control um, and regarding trust. Uh, we, we are at an interesting crossroads right now, I should say, at a stage in the development of cloud computing and the internet. Um, people, I think, fundamentally do trust some forms of online interaction. They really do trust, for example, online banking. They trust that their bank account, their life savings, um, will be handled appropriately, for example, by the bank. And for example, I have no problem believing that my life savings is represented by a number shown to me on a screen by my banking institution, right? So I just happen to trust them. Why do I trust them? Well, maybe it's because we feel that they're a regulated entity, so they have to be accountable to somebody. Maybe it's psychological. Maybe it's something that we've grown so used to over the years that we just accept it. I remember the first time that I deposited money using an ATM, deposited money using an ATM. And that, I really had a problem with that at the time. Now I'm used to it. So why do people trust putting or trust their life savings to online interactions with the bank, uh, but don't necessarily trust the disposition of their data to a cloud provider? What is the difference? What does the cloud provider have to do to earn that trust? And that comes from resp you know, anywhere from responding to third party requests for your data that's being stored in the cloud to, um, to security mechanisms to help prevent um, unauthorized access that is not due to rule of law, breaches, hackers, um, and the like. So we have an interesting gray area uh, from the Google perspective because we do provide enterprise cloud computing services. We provide cloud computing services to businesses, many of them, many of whom have their own regulatory compliance obligations uh, in their own industries. Sometimes they're in certain parts of the world that have very strict uh, privacy requirements like uh, Europe with the EU Data Protection Directive. And they certainly have questions regarding law enforcement access, third party access. So what we do in that regard is we try to provide as much control to the enterprise customers that are using our cloud services as possible so that we put it in their hands. Uh, we can't do it entirely, of course, but as much as we can. Uh, so, for example, you know, in, our, in our situation for third party requests for enterprise data, um, we want those requests to be handled by the customers themselves, not by Google. We don't want to be the compliance team for our customers. They're going to be in the best position to evaluate the process, determine what should be disclosed, and what their options should be. So when we can, we want to defer. Um, in situations where it's not possible to notify affected customers, um, then like all law-abiding companies that, has, that have to respond to that legal process, we have an entire team of personnel that are dedicated to reviewing requests as appropriate to make sure they comply with not only the letter of the law, but also the spirit of the law. And if they don't, then we have to fight it. So that's sort of the the area that we've moved from with regards to uh, consumer services like, like social networking to enterprise cloud services. The other thing I should mention with regards to things like security, um, providers often uh, need to provide some sort of verification to cl enterprise cloud customers. So it's one thing to say that we have great security. It's another thing to provide verification of that, right? Because why should you believe us? Why should you just trust us? because we're sitting here in a panel. So in the enterprise space, what we often do is we hire third party auditors to come in and evaluate our statements to make sure they're true. Um, we can also do things like uh, attain um, a security standard, uh, for example, ISO 27001, to show that at, at the very least, auditors have come in to verify that what we're doing actually attains some sort of security standard to prevent unauthorized access. So there are ways to bridge the gaps between complete lack of uh, visibility and lack of control to empowering the user to have control and feel confident that the data they store online is just as secure, hopefully, as the data regarding their online transactions with a bank. Thank you. Um, we are going to pass to the, uh, the part two of the session. Uh, in this discussion, we will focus on how some of these problems can be addressed at the international level or at the national level but, uh, by adoption of a set of principles uh, protections designed to meet the realities of online and specifically uh, cloud services. 
Um, the focus is on problem solution with the objective of providing concrete proposals for international or national level solutions. Uh, we are going to invite again uh, Bertrand Lechapel, who could just reply to one of the previous questions and make a statement. Thank you, Katita. As a matter of fact, uh, in a previous uh, professional life uh, between 2006 and 2010, I was the uh, French representative for uh, internet governance issues, so uh, in the French Foreign Affairs Ministry. And as probably the only person on this panel, unless I don't know the biographies enough, that has had connections with governments, I just want to make one point nonetheless, is that there is a flip side for all the discussions we have here, which is that all of us, our citizens, are concerned that the appropriate measures can be put in place to identify the relevant information regarding uh, cases where you really need to act. And I don't want to make the list. We all know that this is the case. So the big challenge is the challenge of balance. And the challenge that we have established painfully between civil protection requirements and efficiency of law enforcement on upon which we rely for some elements of security, this difficult, difficult balance that was achieved through sometimes fights in centuries uh, in the uh, traditional space is suddenly moving under our feet in the, uh, in the cyberspace. And one of the reasons why is because if you think about the amount of data that is easily connected and easily analyzed, the, the thing that is at stake is that companies for completely other purposes are de facto either implicitly or explicitly collecting a huge amount of data. Storage costs have plummeted and we discover every day new applications for things. So if you are a responsible company, you want to be careful, but you also want to keep a lot of data because you may have a use of the historical tract of the data and, and all this. The problem is, if you think about the amount of data that is collected, take just geolocation on your phone. If you wanted in a pre-mobile phone area, era to have this data collected on the movements of, let's say, 65 uh, million French people using a mobile phone, you would have needed policemen to track on a daily basis and not on a little notepad where this person has gone and so on. This data would never have been uh, accessible unless an explicit decision were to be made to have somebody to follow the, the movements of someone. The problem is that if you are a very well-meaning law enforcement agency, the existence of this trove of data is unbelievably tempting because you know you can do a lot of good things with them. The problem is how can we all make sure that there is no abuse in the way it is used? And so the challenge that we have, I love the fact that several of us are talking about words like fuzzy, blurred, overlap. The challenge we have is that the clear picture is more complex. It's multi-layered, but it's also about shared responsibilities. And one of the challenges that I, that I have here is that the mental framework within which the law enforcement agencies are in charge of security. Uh, the civil society actors are just in charge of protecting uh, civil liberties. The businesses are just in charge of making money out of their activities. It's not so simple anymore. The fact is that, as was said before, in certain cases, voluntarily or under pressure, companies are being now instrumentalized as law enforcement arms. Some of it is really bad. Some of it is useful because the data that is collected is useful for law enforcement. When civil society actors fight legitimately for the protection of the privacy of individuals, they are also in the responsible role of making sure that what can be done to protect the individuals by a proper exploitation of the data is being done. 
Which leads me to the, the final point. I love the expression digital due process. The thing is, we need new frameworks for the cooperation of actors. We cannot only, and this is part of a response to the, the first question that was asked, on a personal basis and as the lessons that we draw from the Internet and Jurisdiction Program, it is an illusion to believe that everything will be solved by drafting documents, laws, treaties, whatever. This is not what it is about. Because in many cases, you have a question of speed. You have a question of procedures of what is the appropriate level. The comment that was made by, by Pranesh regarding the judges or the court system. There's the problem he mentioned, but there's the problem of speed. In many cases, obtaining a full court decision takes a long time. And so we're confronted with a problem in some cases, we want to be able to have a very quick action that is respectful of due process. And on the other hand, if we respect the due process by going always to courts, either the courts are not completely aware of all the elements that have to be taken into account, or they will take a long time to make a decision. And so I personally uh, would suggest as part of the, um, uh, of the process uh, forward is that one dimension that we are, have been talking about in this uh, session is more or less how much can or should be accessed. There's an element which is what kind of procedures should be put in place. And here, courts are important, but other mechanics of what we call here enhanced corporations are necessary between actors, between government, civil society, private sector. But the most important element is that the national level is not sufficient. Because in many cases, the platforms, and particularly for cloud, are cross-border. And if we wait until each national legislation elaborates its own service and its own provisions, in many cases, it will not solve the cases where you really need to have access to data. And so I would encourage the solutions to move in the direction of what kind of frameworks can be developed for cloud-based services, either for storage or for social media, where the cooperation between the platforms, a certain number of responsible governments willing to take the way and civil society actors that would have the capacity to monitor, for instance, logged uh, requests, uh, would move forward. And this kind of, of frameworks for collaboration uh, will actually be the topic of the workshop we have on, on Thursday. But what is very important is we need to explore the range of tools from complete court-mandated decisions in specific cases to very automated access with third-party control of the logging of the different actors. And within that, you can have all modes of interfaces between the different actors. And I would like to throw in the discussion something we'll explore further on, fr on Thursday, which is the notion of procedural interfaces. Platforms have procedures to implement their terms of service. The uh, governments, law enforcement, and data protection authorities have their own procedures. But most of them are not sufficiently documented, they are not sufficiently transparent, and they are not interoperable. We need to work on the interoperability and traceability of all those requests. Let me just uh, make three brief points. Uh, the first, building on what Bertrand said, I agree, I agree absolutely responding to the, the lady's question from the start that um, surveillance policy making needs to be much more multi-stakeholder. That's how you deal with getting the technological understanding that Wendy was talking about, about the civil society and human rights input, input from privacy regulators who far too often have to come in at the end to clear up a mess rather than contribute to the debate at the start about what the policy should look like. Um, 
one reason that hasn't happened is the technologists try very hard to explain these issues to policymakers. Often, though, the voice of intelligence and law enforcement agencies are very strong within government. Politicians, all from the left and the right, like to appear tough on crime. That was a favourite Tony Blair phrase. Um, and I think that you um, absolutely need continued, meaningful, strong oversight from the judiciary and from legislatures. I'm not quite as comfortable as Bertrand about automating this and thinking transparency and multi-stakeholder auditing and so on um, can can go very far in. Well, I, I, I would I would go much to, towards you know one end of your range on that. I think the U.S. Uh, actually has one has has a number of things right on surveillance policy one of which is Congress has much greater oversight of what the US intelligence agencies do than almost any other nation that I know certainly compared to the UK and I think that's something legislatures more widely should look at secondly on jurisdiction um, I, I co-authored a report with Dawa Korf for the Global Network Initiative earlier this year called Digital Freedoms in International Law. One of the things that we recommended w in there was that when companies like Google, like Facebook, like RIM um, are asked for voluntary or less voluntary cooperation by governments, by governments outside their, their main markets and certainly their, their headquarters in the US, that by and large, the route for law enforcement agencies in other countries to get access to user data held by those kind of companies um, should be through mutual, through multilateral treaties. It should not be through putting pressure on international companies. You know, Google and Facebook and RIM do not want to be put in the position of making these judicial decisions. You know, that, that, that's not their expertise. Um, and the Council of Europe Cybercrime Convention is one framework that would meet some of those tests. So I know some of the people from the Council of Europe that work on that are here. It's been strongly criticized in some places that it doesn't go far enough on human rights protections, but I think that's something that could be worked on. Uh, that's, uh, I think, an example of the kind of multilateral framework that could deal with this much better than these voluntary data disclosures. Uh, and then finally, the, the, um, on the more technological side, it was a very interesting discussion, I think, between, uh, between Bruce and Wendy and Mark about you know, what causes people ultimately users to trust these systems or not trust. Um, absolutely, companies like Google have a lot of information security expertise. You can be sure that the, sec the security of Google servers is going to be better than 90%, 99% probably of desktop PCs. So certainly, I think that's a valid point to make. Um, at the same time, I would say uh, there's some interesting research going on about, uh, Bruce mentioned, yes, of course, you can encrypt data before you put it in the cloud and only you have the keys to decrypt it. it it's a, at a very early stage, but there is research into homomorphic encryption that would allow you to do similar things with computation in the cloud on encrypted data. So I, 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 I know Bruce was simplifying for the debate. I, I, wouldn't, um, I wouldn't want you to go away from today thinking that cloud computing necessarily means that you have to give more and more plain text access to third parties. That's not always the case, although it is often the case. Often the incentives the companies have will push in that direction. Uh, there's, there's all sorts of research into how people can limit the trust they have to put into computing systems that are outside their own direct control. And I think one of the fundamental points there that, I w that I'll finish on is this to me why, this to me is why data minimization as a principle of data protection regulation remains absolutely vital. I, you often hear discussion where people, where people will say, well, minimization isn't important. It's long as it's, it's fine, things are fine, collect as much data as you like, so long as the procedures are in place to protect it. And I think that from a political economy perspective is completely the wrong way around. I think we've seen this over and over and over again in, in Europe that, uh, you know, as internet engineers say, if you build it, they will come. In this case, they being law enforcement and intelligence agencies. If private sector parties start building up large quantities of data about their users, you can be sure if the legal powers don't yet exist for that to be accessed, that they will soon enough. Thank you, uh, that was quick. Uh, I we have to be quick because we are um, with the time limit. Uh, I would like to give, uh, I will uh, start from uh, Illinois um, to make a quick remark. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think I would echo what, um, what has been said that uh, this process and this solution to security really does need to be um, multi-stakeholder. Um, both at the national level and the international level. Um, I think it's crucial that governments and international organizations and civil society and private sector organizations all work together to come up with principles. And I think there's actually a lot of um, movement towards this. I mean, this, this 
um, event here. And last month we had uh, a meeting in Brussels that looked at due process principles uh, for digital communications that could be presented to to government. And I'll actually just go through a couple of those principles that were were discussed. Um, in, in trying to find a, a balance between uh, the need for lawful access and protecting um, baseline human rights. Um, so for example, uh, necessity, uh, that if there are requests for lawful access, it, it has to be necessary and it has to be um, demonstrably necessary also. Um, proportionality was another principle that was discussed. And so there can't be blanket accesses for, or requests for access. They should be very, very specific. Um, due process uh, in, in the process of lawful access. Um, user notification. So when possible, the, the user should be notified um, in, in such a way that does not infringe upon, upon the inve investigation. Um, uh, transparency was another another important principle that I think was discussed, and I actually think, uh, perhaps in the context of India, this is a really key uh, key principle, and in other contexts as well, where surveillance is very untransparent and people really don't know what's going on. Um, I think there are certain things that service providers can be transparent about. Uh, for example, how the procedure for lawful access works. I mean, many people don't know how that works. And I think just empowering the citizen in that way will give them the ability to be informed and protest when they think something is, is not happening or is infringing upon their rights. And I don't think it's unreasonable to ask uh, the government or for service providers to, uh, to take those things into consideration and be transparent about certain practices. Um, I would, for the sake of time, I won't go through all the principles, but I'd actually encourage people to visit the website. I think, Katitha, what's the? Necessary and proportionate. I think necessary and proportionate uh, dot net. Uh, to visit that and perhaps give your comments on those principles. Also to address your question about um, what can you do um, or what kind of recommendations can you give for the Indian government. Recently, uh, a report um, by Justice A.P. Shaw was released to the public on privacy, and it gives recommendations for privacy uh, legislation in India. I can, I'd be happy to email that to you, actually. But I think uh, that incorporates a lot of the principles that, that uh, I just discussed and, and some more that I would like to be seen um, brought to a discussion with the government. Right, and, and, to, and to bring civil society. And I'd also like to note that I think that the Indian government is uh, taking really good steps towards this. I mean, uh, the Center for Internet and Society was on a, a committee with Justice A.P. Shaw that created this report, and it was a committee made up of civil society and industry and, and the government, and we, we all worked together, and we had our differences, true, but, but we also created this report, and. Um, just the other day, the telecom or the IT minister said that he is really open and wants to create spaces for civil society. So I see those as very encouraging um, steps. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask the um, technical people uh, from <laughs> the Bruce Schneier and then uh, Sandy, if you, they have a quick reaction. And especially um, another comment from, um, is there any and, and, and any, any other person who could reply to the lady in the front? So I'll be very quick. I mean, my feeling is that we're just going to have to tough this out. We are in the middle of uh, a pr profound series of technical changes in our lives leading to s different social changes. These things law enforcement are trying to deal with are, are new and they're confused. There's a huge generation gap. And I, I mean, I, I want to echo what everyone else said about multi-stakeholder and communication, but I, I don't see any way this is going to be resolved quickly. Just like the change of business models in the entertainment industry isn't being resolved quickly. This is going to take a generation to sort out. And, and the best we can do as people in this field is educate those outside of this community who are trying to impose their regulations on our community. I mean, what, what's changing is not that regulations are happening. We, we, we've always been regulated, but we've been regulated by ourselves. Right? The IETF is, does fundamentally different job regulating the internet than 
a government will, just because the, the pressures are different, the needs are different. And the more we in our community can educate those outside our community and how we work, how the technology works, how the socialization works, the better way we can do. I mean, in a generation, we're going to look back at this, this time, at, at the tumultuous change of everything, and be amazed we got through it. I mean, for us here, we just have to get through it. Wendy? Uh, thanks. I, I want to pick up on one of the uh, points that's come up, up and down the table, um, around transparency, um, because I think that serves a, a critical role in the learning to deal with these new challenges uh, as they come up. That in order for us to adapt to new technological, legal intersections, we as a public, um, as well as, as whatever segment of the public we come forward, uh, have to see the impacts uh, of the change, um, have to see what's possible, what, uh, what it's possible to discover, what uh, law enforcement is trying to achieve, what providers uh, of services are doing to protect that information. Uh, and so we heard about the, uh, the, the audits uh, that enterprise customers can request uh, of Google services. Uh, the public can uh, request similar audits by uh, asking for transparent disclosure uh, of practices. And here I want to, to praise Google uh, and, and Twitter for uh, being open uh, and upfront in their disclosures of uh, as much information as they're able to give. Uh, and I'd want to request uh, of anyone who's uh, here from law enforcement uh, to see these uh, disclosure reports uh, as helping law enforcement to do its job better too because they help the public to understand uh, when these requests are necessary and uh, uh, and to to push back when they're not. Uh, they're part of the, the checks and balances that, that keep uh, the laws uh, and the technology working together. Uh, so I, I'd, I'd say transparency uh, gives data to the multi-stakeholder process and to the deliberations that we uh, can all have about w what law is um, appropriate. Sophie, a quick reaction and then a question from the back. Thank you. Possible actions. First, I think that there needs to be a full implementation of the regulatory uh, schemes that exist. I mentioned the Cybercrime Convention, the Data Protection Convention. Really, this this uh, shifting it to enhance cooperation, I think this is absolutely necessary. But first, we need the regulatory frameworks. We're, we're speaking about fundamental rights and possible infringements to those rights. So you need a strong regulatory framework then indeed stronger cooperation. We're working uh, in the field of cybercrime with, um, uh, on the topic of public and private partnership for exchange of information. So that's something which would be a possible solution. Uh, this is something which is addressed. Um, then about further normative work, I think the, the, those principles you mentioned on due process, uh, this is very interesting. It's something that the Council of Europe could lift to an intergovernmental platform, for instance. Uh, so, so this is really something we should, we should work towards together, I think. And uh, finally, about uh, uh, still better cooperating with the actors, um, we had adopted some years ago some human rights guidelines for ISPs, uh, precisely in that field to enable uh, LEAs to have their, their requests satisfied, but with the human rights approach. So uh, things like that can be done, and we should continue doing it uh, in the Council of Europe. Thank you. Uh, questions, uh, first, um, you, and then the guy, well, the guy in the back, and then in on front, and then we have Mark. Good morning, can you hear me? Uh, good morning, Luca Belli. I'm an Isaac ambassador, but I'm speaking in my own capacities. And uh, I would like to make a comment on what uh, Bertrand de la Chapelle and uh, Ian Brown were saying about uh, building up a uh, sort of uh, cooperation between different stakeholders, notably public and private stakeholders. Uh, I think I'm convinced that the only way to, to cope with uh, issues with regard to the internet is to build up public-private cooperations uh, and uh, 
a in a multi-stakeholder fashion and to uh, go through uh, tr through the, the the path of the uh, core regulation to involve both private actors and public actors because uh, if you think about it uh, internet is quintessentially private everything is private isp are private everything is managed in a private way so uh, if uh, we we have two different uh, paths uh, left to leave the, the regulation just to private actors uh, that can enforce their will through terms of use and uh, can they uh, and they will not uh, uh, think about internet uh, uh, users rights and their fundamental rights or uh, try the, the public uh, public uh, entities can try to uh, uh, to enforce their will uh, and to make their, their their legislation fit in in this uh, quintessentially private uh, environment but i think that uh, the last 20 years of history have proven that uh, uh, that is not really easy uh, so uh, to me the only way in order to 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 uh, uh, protect users rights and to envisage a, 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 an efficient solution is to build up uh, public private uh, uh, partnership uh, co-regulation and involve both private actors and uh, uh, public actors in, in a common dialogue thank you Hi there. Um, a really question for Bruce and any other, the other panel. A um, hundred years ago, 120 years ago, we used to go to the bank down the road and put our diamonds and anything we valued in a bank. Surely the question that we should be addressing today is, is, it, is our understanding of what a bank is in the 21st century really, uh, rel is, it, is it accurate? And should we actually be looking to things called banks? to store things of value in the cloud or anywhere else. It's just that our terminology is out of date. Interested in any views? Hi. Uh, Vivek Krishnamurthy from Foley Hoag. I just want to say that I think there should be some more room for optimism on this panel. The cloud means that data, the architecture of the internet is such that the cloud is going to be located near key interconnects. Those happen to be in democracies. Those happen to be in places with robust political regulation, robust democratic climate. So I actually feel better at the fact that the person in Syria or Uzbekistan has their email ser you know, served up from Palo Alto or Singapore than in the older model where it would be a local ISP that's retaining that data. So I see this actually as a, as a positive development for security and privacy. My name is Murat. Uh, I'm from law enforcement. Uh, my question is for industry representatives here. Um, the thing is about um, the being visible to customers and transparency. Do you have any classification regarding the crimes uh, which uh, the suspect is accused of? Because the classification is important and some crimes are really important because we are trying to investigate them and uh, if they know what happened, that's going to be the case, uh, they will probably uh, fly away or something like that. So what is your opinion? Thank you. If um, the word to Mark, um, if someone else wants to reply from the panel, you have to raise your hand. A small tidbit of information, by the way. Uh, thank, thank you very much for the comment regarding law enforcement um, interaction. Before Google, many, many years ago, I was FBI, actually. So I know the law enforcement concerns, and I know the angle. But I also know, after many other years, uh, how important it is to protect user information. Um, law enforcement does not necessarily provide provi uh, give providers with the kind of transparency that providers would otherwise want, with re or, or maybe they don't want, with regards to the, the basis for these legal requests. We may not know what these requests are. Law enforcement may not want to share it with us. Um, Furthermore, it isn't necessarily within the provider's purview to make their own judgment call whether they should interact with law enforcement. If we're in a jurisdiction that is, that, that is subject to a rule of law, then there should already be, potentially, um, some sort of review as to whether or not this is a valid legal process. So we can't be the judge of whether or not the process is accurate, and that's assuming the law enforcement wants to share that data with us. Um, but from a larger perspective, um, if law enforcement conducts themselves within the law and, and pursuant to uh, 
guidelines outlined by the legislators then 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 it's much easier for providers to be able to interact with law enforcement so that's why from a policy perspective continuing to engage regulators regarding clarity in law enforcement process is very very important parity between online and offline protections um, and from a pr practical perspective um, where users need to develop trust they should review what information is available out there regarding transparency um, so they can make their own risk assessment uh, it's very interesting for example Google's own transparency report is publicly available we list how many requests we get from every country what percentage we comply with uh, this is very good information um, but we do that in a broad way so that we don't uh, jeopardize a specific investigation right because we have to strike a balance Okay, um, Bruce, um, we close after this. Because so, so very quickly, I, uh, I think I want to an answer the question in the back. I think a lot of our metaphors are out of date. I mean, banks are not what they were 100 years ago. I mean, friends are not what they were 100 years ago. I mean, a, a lot of the words we're using for these new things are old words, but they're different. And that's a fundamental problem with communicating what we're doing to, to non-technologists. Right, a wastebasket on your computer is not a wastebasket. It, it, it's a different sort of thing. Uh, to, to speak to this person, I, I, I believe we, this is a pretty optimistic panel. Security people sound more pessimistic than they are because we deal in exceptions, because we deal in the bad guys and the bad actors. Uh, I felt very optimistic, and, and you're right. Moving to the cloud is beneficial in security for most people. My mother is much more secure because her data is on Gmail than it was when it was her computer. She can't lose it. I don't have to rescue it. It's wonderful. And, and for a lot of people, that's true. I mean, that's why the cloud is so, is so compelling. Everyone loves it. When they lose their phone, they get a new phone, push a button, and their contacts reappear by magic. We really like that. So, so don't take... What we're talking about here is overall pessimism. We're, we're, we're looking at the edges. We're looking at the negative conditions. But a lot, the reason these, these things are happening is because they're so beneficial. We are going to give one minute to each participant for a closing, but one minute, please, because we, are running, we already run out of time. <laughs> Thank you, Katica. Um, <clears throat> I love the distinction that Ian made between law enforcement and intelligence and surveillance these two uh, different categories. He used the word data minimization. He is absolutely right regarding the data that uh, platforms collect voluntarily from the, um, uh, the users. But you cannot have data minimization with the amount of personal data that users are putting on social network platforms, which basically explain everything they've done from what they ate at breakfast and, and the rest. We're not talking about the same type of data. One is privacy, and the other I usually call intimacy uh, data. And finally, um, the lesson that we get from this environment is that we should try to move away mentally from the sharp distinctions of there are frontiers that separate jurisdiction A on the right and jurisdiction B on the left. In many cases, you need the cooperation not only between different governments or different agencies, but also different operators. And using in that regard a set of tools uh, one interesting trend I see, if companies are beginning to hire law enforcement aid, uh, former law enforcement officials uh, and civil society activists, actually, I think uh, governments and should consider more hiring people who have a previous corporate experience and civil society actors, which is actually happening, and it is a very good thing, because then there's a better understanding. Just ten, 10 seconds, I it, agree with om almost everything Bertrand said. I, you're right, Google, in, Google and other companies are sort of in miniature little multi-stakeholder environments in their own way. Um, <laughs> um, I think uh, on the, the information users post about themselves, of course, there's only so far you can go with protecting people's privacy. You can't be too paternalistic. Okay, I just wanted to actually thank you for your comments again about um, it actually not being a completely negative or um, a harmful thing in the cloud. And I want to, perhaps that's a takeaway for me, that in critiques we should always try to be very positive because they create a much more, um, uh, 
a dialogue that's actually that you can work with. So instead of civil society constantly critiquing the government, instead it's a positive critique on how we can all work together to um, create better solutions. So thank you for that. I'll forego my statement. <laughs> I've said enough. Uh, I'll say one more sentence. I mean, uh, an important lesson is that any laws and regulations need to be technologically invariant. The more we can do that, the better we will, or the better we'll fare. If we, if we force things to do deal with specific technologies, they fail as soon as the technologies change. But in fun the f these are fundamentally human interactions. If you focus on the human interaction, it doesn't matter how it happens or where it happens. And I think it's just a better way to look at this. Yes, so I come from a regional organization, but the issues we're tackling are global issues, and I think if we manage to adopt common uh, visions, common standards on those issues, we'll also be closer to, uh, to bridging the gap with those difficulties. So, uh, um, so uh, yeah, I'm just promoting Convention 108 on data protection and the Cybercrime Convention. Uh, uh, th th the principles that we have, uh, are technologically invariant and the laws that we adopt to uh, meet them of due process and transparency and minimization uh, should also uh, similarly uh, be broadly written and then applied uh, specific to the technology. Thank you everyone and sorry we ran out of time. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. internet connection is not working at all. I said, uh, I said, I just wanted to say it's